So here we are. It's my pleasure to be with you again on Wow, What a Show. What a great show. Every day the performance of God is so evident in the very creation. As it is written in Psalm 19, the heavens do declare the glory of God. The firmament does show forth his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night knowledge. There is no place where the sound of it, the very sound of it is not heard. Yesterday was one of those great days. Good evening, Tony. How are you? Here we are gathered and I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. I am Phyllis, the host of Wow What a Show and the Rehoboth Institute of the Arts podcast. And uh, India, when we come here, right, we are here to do one thing and one thing alone. And that's find out who we are in relation to him by looking into ourselves and by having good fellowship with one another. Yeah, um, you know, also to highlight the works of those who are in uh, his service and so willing to be. God is a great God above all the earth, and it's really quite a privilege and a joy to be in relationship with him. It's a wonderful thing. So we're here. And um, I, Tony, I, if you can't hear me, let me know. Whoa. So sorry. Here we are. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm having so uh, a trouble. I need a new phone, so I will be purchasing one. And tonight I'm on the computer, and I hope that won't cause any real issues for for um, anyone. Uh, last week we did indeed uh, uh, read a poem that, for me, is very important. I explained that I learned this poem. I heard the poem first. Okay, good. Thank you. I heard the poem first from uh, Ravi Zacharias, who built a very imp impressive and beautiful uh, ministry in apologetics. So for all who don't know what apologetics is, it is um, the defense of the gospel or the defense of a faith, whatever it is. It's giving evidence. And so Ravi built a, a tremendous, a tremendous ministry that was all over the world. He witnessed to many um, heads of state and um, I guess prime ministers and, you know, uh, people who are in high uh, ranking government. He also finally went into um, ministering to young people to prepare them for the ministry in in this evangelism because first and foremost he said he was an evangelist more than an apologist you know apologetics is a field where you kind of have to know a lot of stuff you have to read you have to understand philosophy and be able to uh, defend the faith uh, um, with regard to the philosophical thought that is out there about faith um, but he he didn't have the best end at least in the public I hear that many things are coming out to rectify what was reported of his ill. And it was amazing that the Lord kept him from the shame of that all during, during his lifetime. Uh, but just as it was coming out, Ravi had cancer in his back and uh, he died. It, it happened all very quickly. And it was very much a sad thing. I had followed him since my mid, you know, early life, and I uh, had met him, studied with his team for uh, on one occasion. I was really blessed by that ministry. So um, I was sad to hear of all the things that went on with regard to the end of his ministry. And you know, we don't want to end badly. Uh, and Ravi used to say that all the time. He would lift Billy Graham up because Billy Graham, of all the, you know, uh, really uh, famous or well-known evangelists, had a very um, he had a great life, a life that did not, in any way, uh, speak of immoral character. And so Ravi Zacharias has always said he wanted that, you know, 
So for it to end up the way it did was quite a shock to me. Nonetheless, you know, God's got Ravi's reputation, his work. He's got all of that in his sight. The Lord knows, he understands, and he will make whatever uh, should come of the things that we have heard of him. You know, God will, he will write it if it's wrong. (laughs) And he will write it uh, even if it's right, because our relationship is with him. And God reads the heart of a man, not the external, as so many people do. So um, tonight I want to continue with the the idea of uh, discipleship, you know, but now I'm looking at lives. Who are the people who've lived beyond the um, by the era of the, you know, establishing of the church? Who are these people uh, through whom the gospel has, has traveled and who have suffered for the kingdom of God so that we still are coming behind. You know, Christianity is really a very, very um, strong and, and generational faith. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, are, so are all faiths, I would guess. Hello, mommy. It's a blessing. Okay, he's talking to Sister Reams. Hello, Sister Reams. Hello, Sister Gabs. Um, so we, we, I, tonight, a, a, as I read from last week's um, the poem, when God wants to drill a man, right, and thrill a man, watch his ways. Watch what the Lord does with us as he prepares us to be his own. See, we are his. When we come to him, we belong to him. He paid the price for us. <laughs> it's like we were, you know, we could have been, okay, uh, being sold off to death. But God retrieved that sale. Uh, He called us out of darkness. He called us from the death. Uh, We were dead in trespasses and sin. He exchanged his own life for our redemption. And it was a life that was prepared to bear the cross as Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And you know, it's all a big mystery. It is quite a mystery. I don't know that anybody can really explain it. I believe that is why the word of God tells us that now we see through a glass darkly, but then we shall see and know, even as we are known, we will be with him face to face. So the mystery of these things that we cannot see will be open to us. We will see. And we will never be God, but we will be God's children in the family living, I believe, as I lived with my mother and father, right? And he will see to all things at that time. But in the meanwhile, we are trusting the word of God. Somebody, uh, I think my my family, you know, they meet uh, on on text and I I miss some of the um, the text that in the string. So I don't kind of always know exactly what's going on, but I did read uh, not too long ago, a riddle or a question that came through and the, you know, so everybody digs and tries to find the answer. And the answer was, do we have the whole word of God? Do we have the whole word? So I didn't do the research because I've been really so busy nine to five. I mean, what, what am I talking about? seven to five busy we're busy sister room room can attest to that and i'm very tired so i didn't do the you know i didn't i read it in passing and then i didn't see everything so i i just left that alone but the answer came back no we do not have all the word and i i kind of um you know contemplated that for a second i didn't really go into the bible and do anything but i i I kind of believe we we do have that part of when we refer to the word, we are talking about, I believe, the record of uh, those things that have transpired between God and man and the record of what God has done and and it, it both in terms of our creation and in terms of our redemption. And then the record of what will come with regards to the 
completion of all things. And um, so we've got that word, right? And and I don't know, you know, the, the detail of all that they were looking for, but that's that's kind of how I see the word. And so that we have the whole word, I'm saying the, the part of it that God intended for us to have, I believe we have the whole thing. And yet we know that he spoke a word that we didn't hear prior to our being formed as men and women. And when we see him face to face, he will speak again and we will hear him and understand him. But for the second that we have to live here, we um, we are, I believe, dealing with the fullness of his word. So um, tonight I have titled this sharing, and please talk back to me, Discipleship and My Life. <clears throat> my life, my life, but I'm not going to talk about my life. I'm going to talk about Eric Little's life. So I'm bringing, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm roping it in, you know, I'm catching the fish and I've caught Eric Little. He came to me, um, that in, it just entered my mind last week when we were talking through uh, when a man, when God wants to drill a man. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to talk about Eric Little, L-I-D-D, L E, I think is how you, uh, yeah, L I D D E L L. Sorry, Eric Little, I believe, is um, is um, Scott. He's from from Scotland, so his name, of course, is a little bit different. Eric is E R I C, but his last name Little L I D D E L L. Now, many of you maybe have seen the movie Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire. The movie was made about this man, Eric Little. And uh, it's a great, it's a really good movie, but it doesn't tell the whole story. I think at the end of the movie, it looks like Eric is triumphant in all things, whatever. But Eric um, was one of those people who gives a, a lot, gives a lot, as the Lord calls him to the field. And remember, when God wants to drill a man, watch his ways, watch what he does, watch how God does that. See, we, we are not ready yet to step onto the um, stage of the kingdom of God for the sake of the world's redemption. We are, have to be prepared because we ourselves have been called into something that we did not know before new life, new birth, the new creation is new. It really is new. And it takes quite a bit of moments with the Lord to begin to get accustomed to living that new life, that new birth. And if we're not careful and we don't watch our ways with the Lord, spend a lot of time with him, we may find ourselves straddling two kingdoms. You will find yourself living you know, on, on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, whatever it is for you, uh, in the kingdom. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and you may be living according to the world's ways. But God wants to strain us out of that. He wants to strain the the leftovers, the uh, residuals of being dead uh, to the world, uh, operating in your own mind and operating in the flesh. He wants to strain that out of us so that we are purified and made whole in and according to what wholeness is in the kingdom of God. So I'm going to read tonight, and I'm going to read it because I kind of don't want to miss a lot of stuff about Eric Little. And I want you to watch God in this life, right? One, The, the, the writer says um, that one of their favorite all-time movies is Chariots of Fire, and it was released in 1981. Um, <clears throat> it's the only reason, he says, that many people are familiar with Eric Little, uh, the Flying Scotsman. Well, I don't think it was for me. Uh, my introduction to Eric Little was probably through uh, just, you know, I, I used to read prolifically about uh, people in the kingdom of God, etc. So, um, but the movie is really quite fascinating, and it probably is for a lot of people who didn't know him. So he was called the Flying Scotsman, 
and he shocked the world by refusing to run the 100 meters in the 1924 Paris Olympics. It was a race he was favored to win. He withdrew because the qualifying heat was on Sunday and he believed God didn't want him to run on the Lord's day. So Little went on to win a gold medal despite the fact that he didn't run that race. And he, he broke a world record in the 400 meters, not even his strongest event. It's amazing. In the black and white ghetto, that's the real Eric Little in his gold medal winning 400 meters final at the Olympics. It's amazing. So the guy says that his favorite lines from the movie are when Eric, the person who played Eric's character, it was written in by the writer, who, the, I think Colin Wellen, he says, Eric Little didn't really say this, but he, anyway, the guy says his favorite line from the movie is um, when he says to his sister, God made me fast and when I run, I feel his pleasure. So <clears throat> the guy says here who wrote this, I still remember sitting with his wife, Nancy, in a large Portland theater in 1981, smiling and crying through various parts of that unforgettable movie, Chariots of Fire. It ends with these brief words about Eric Little's life after the Olympics. Eric Little, <clears throat> excuse me, missionary, died in occupied China at the end of World War II, all of Scotland mourned. Isn't that something? When, when your life story is told and mine is told, right, by some person out there, if they even bother to tell it, or even people who know you and they talk about you, they're going to talk about the highlight. They're not going to remember. They're not going to, you know, talk about the part of it that is not uh, sensational. I, I, I dare say they would or they wouldn't. Or they may talk about the sensational part. It doesn't have to be good, but they're going to they're gonna lift up <laughs> the part that is sensational to them. And so in the story of Eric Little is that he he ran away a uh, race that he did not even, you know, expect to run. He didn't prepare to run for that race. And yet, he, because he wouldn't run on Sunday, he ran it and he won. And he got a gold medal for so doing. But after the Olympics and his graduation, because I think he was in college when he did, he did that, Eric returned as a missionary to China, where he had been born to missionary parents in 1902. It's the same year of my dad's birth, or either my dad, where we think it was. When the Japanese occupation made life dangerous, he sent his pregnant wife, Florence, and their two daughters to Canada. Japanese invaders placed him in a squalid, prison camp without running water or working bathrooms. There, separated from his family, Eric lived several years before dying at age 43. Can you imagine? Upon learning of his death, it wasn't just Scotland that mourned. All over the world, people had uh, who had been inspired by him in the Olympics and in the Christian life joined the mourning. On the surface, it all seems so tragic. Why did God withhold from this great man of faith a long life, years of fruitful service, the championship of the companionship of his wife, and the joy of raising those beloved children? It doesn't make sense. And yet, there is another way to look at Eric Little's story. Nancy and I, the author of this paper, calls his wife Nancy, and they discovered our firsthand when he spent an unforgettable day in England with Phil and Margaret Holder in May of 1988. We knew almost nothing about the Holders except that Phil was a pastor. Some missionary friends were, we were visiting in England took us to their home in Reading. Margaret was born in China to missionary parents with China Inland Mission. And uh, in 1939, when Japan took control of Eastern China, 13-year-old Margaret was imprisoned by the Japanese in uh, Wising internment camp, where many foreigners in Beijing were sent. There she remained separated from her parents for six years. Finally, Little 
decided to referee. Oh, I'm sorry. Where, and that's where she met Eric Little. So uh, let's see. I skipped a page here somehow. <clears throat> I don't know how I got these pages out of order. Sorry, I'm going to come back to it. So Eric, uh, I, I know the story, but I just wanted to read it. Anyway, she was there. And um, let me see, where's my page? And you know where you copy this stuff and it doesn't have any page numbers on it. Oh, so Margaret shared uh, a story with the, with the couple, the guy who was writing this, that illustrated this man's Christ-like character. In the camp, the children... <laughs> this is awful, I'm sorry. Played basketball, rounders, and hockey. And Eric Little was their referee. Not surprisingly, though, he refused to referee on Sundays, but in his absence, the children fought. So he struggled over, over the fact that they were fighting and believed he shouldn't, start, he shouldn't start the children from playing because they needed the diversion. So he finally decided that he would referee on Sundays. And this made a deep impression on Margaret. She knew that the athlete, the world-famous athlete, uh, she saw he was sacrificing success for principle and he was not a legalist. Now that's funny, right? Because he wouldn't run on Sunday to get that, that uh, world record. But he went out and started, he gave it up. He, that, that was his tradition. He wouldn't do anything on Sunday like that. But when he saw these children needed the diversion in a prison camp, a squalid, dirty camp, where there was no running water and not really good food, he decided that he should referee them on Sunday. He gave it up for his own glory, but he surrendered it all for those children. He surrendered to the principal. Little uh, sacrificed a gold medal for himself, though he ultimately won the gold in a different race in the name of truth but he would bend over backwards for others in the name of grace. Now I'm going to tell you, that's what struck me in this story, right? We are, um, we live a life where people are so bound to uh, the way that they want to do a thing or to a tradition that they do. The apostle Paul, even Jesus Christ, he, you know, when they were the, the, those folks were criticizing him for uh, healing someone on a Sunday, or I mean on a Sabbath, on the Sabbath, he said to the people, "The Sabbath was given to man for man, not man given for the Sabbath." When we get so locked in to a, a way of doing something, and we think that there is no f flexibility when it is required of us to do something for someone else in sacrifice as Jesus Christ did. We are missing, we are missing really and truly the gospel. You know what we're missing? We are missing the indwelling, the awareness that Christ lives in us and that he will have us do things according to his good pleasure in a moment in time. And it does not have to follow a ritual. But we are so bound in our own thinking. We really believe that we've got the right answer. That astounds me. It so astounds me. It'll always have. When I am with people who are so decisive, they know exactly what they want to do. They know exactly how they want to do. They know exactly, and they do it. And I'm so indecisive. I'm always like weighing and trying to see, should it go this way? Should it go that way? I don't care how bold I talk or how, all you know. Now, some things really and truly, if I believe the Lord has said to me a thing, I'm doing that thing. And I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to do what I believe God said for me to do. That comes from being in relationship and really believing that you've heard his voice, right? He does talk with us. He does. But these 
the, the, you know, the, 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 the fact that a, a man can be so assured of his rightness always has been a marvel to me. And I used to marvel at people who were like that and wonder why I wasn't decisive like that. But I don't believe now anymore. I don't believe with when it comes to the matters of, of the kingdom of God and the things that we ought to be doing in fellowship and in service to the to, to the uh, the unbelievers and the even the service to believers. I believe we really do have to step back and say, I don't know the first thing about what to do, but God does. God does. So we learn to hear from the Lord. And that's what I think was going on with Eric Little. Because the lady goes on, I'm going to start reading. She goes on to, to recount how he did that in that camp and how he would teach the, the, the children and the uh, people who were interred in there, how his countenance was always one of joy. He was always giving, always uh, up and about it, right? This man who wouldn't run a race on Sunday for the glory of the world in that prison camp was a soldier for the Lord and in the kingdom. And accordingly, she says that uh, not only did he organize sports and recreation through his time in internment camp, he helped many people through teaching and tutoring. He gave special care to the older people, the weak and the ill, to whom the conditions in the camp were very trying. He was always involved in the Christian meeting, which uh, were the meetings which were part of camp life. And despite the squalor of the open cesspools, the rats, oh my goodness, the flies, the disease in that crowded camp, life took on a very normal routine, though without the faithful and cheerful support of Eric Little, many people would never have been able to manage. And she says, none of us will ever forget this man who was totally committed to putting God first. A man whose humble life combined muscular, I like that phrase, muscular Christianity with radiant godliness. Oh my goodness, that the Lord would be able to say such a thing about my life. Mm squalor. Oh my goodness, disease. <laughs> no running water. You know, I used to uh, talk with my friends about, um, you know, Christian life, and we we were going to conferences, and one of the things that was a draw was uh, the accommodations. People wanted to go where everything was upscale, on top of the mountain. <sighs> Oh, we gotta stay in the this and the that, and we can do this and we can eat this food and that food, you know? I'm saying, wow. Mm. Now listen, I, I want you to know, I am not one for even an outhouse. It's hard for me to use an outhouse. I grew up, I mean, I didn't grow up in a house. I was born in a house that had an outhouse. And as a child, I was afraid to go in an outhouse. Isn't that something? So I am not the kind of person that says, I want to go live in, you know, in a in a tent where there's a squalor and you know bad disease and rats and all that. I'm not that person. I'm not. But I pray that if the Lord should call me, that I'd be able to live through it. And when I go on retreat, I remember there was going to be a fasting retreat. You go on retreat, but there was not going to be any food. I wonder how many people who actually went on that retreat because the the folks I know who call <laughs> who are Christians, they're not trying to be in a place where things are not really well done. And, you know, we use the excuse that we are born into a time uh, where, that, you know, we, we in America, I don't know about any place else in the world, but we because we are we have certain things that are available to us. Now, all of us can't afford what is, what's out there, but it's available to us. So we kind of think that if I'm going to pay my money to go somewhere, it ought to be really hunky-dory wonderful, right? Mm. So this man, this man, Eric Little, for the glory of God. And then he died in that internment camp. He never saw his wife again. 
he never saw his children again. And he sent them away to protect them and to keep them. But he never saw them again. He died at 43. So I'm just thinking through discipleship in my life. Now, discipleship isn't the calling, right? It is the inter interrelationship between um, the, the, a newborn person and Christ by way of those people who are there to see to it that we grow in Christ and understand the gospel. And do we, as we are discipling others, make them aware that when you come to Christ, it isn't to, you know, to 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 uh, live in a house that is, um, you know, uh, lavish and to have lavish accommodations and all the worldly trappings of a good life. You may have a good life. I'm not saying that you won't have a good life. And when you come to Christ, all that stuff you may already have attained. But that, I don't believe that has a thing to do with being born again. I do not believe that when we come to Jesus Christ, that our focus and our minds are still on that kind of lifestyle. I believe if God has given it to you, you got it. But I would, now nah, this is me, you know, I'm not talking about anybody else. I would open the doors of my house. I tell the Lord right now, you know, I'll open them anyway. And, and be really some some things about where I live, I just, it doesn't please me. But I will open the door and let anybody come in. But now, don't you know, if I live in a house on the hill, girl, I probably would have a whole, I would, I, I would probably bring home so many people to live with me. And I know I would have um, dinner for folks who are homeless on Thanksgiving. And I'd probably bring home folks from the, you know, my limit is not having. <laughs> That's my limit. That's why I am not a, a stronger person in the kingdom. Half the time, I don't even have a car. You know, my, we're sharing one car in our house now. So uh, things are a little bit tight. But honest to goodness, well, I should know, don't even have to say that. If the Lord beckoned me bring somebody home, I would labor in this house, clean it up, and put them in a room that I felt was comfortable for them. I would do the best that I can. So it, that I'm talking I. It shouldn't be I. I. I just believe that Jesus Christ walked and he had nowhere to lay his head, you know. Uh, so he wasn't really trying to live high on the hog like that. Uh, at, but we but we do. In, in this Christian life, we are striving all the time to live a little bit better. Just a little bit better. My friend and I have started a um, business, right? And we, we've we been there now for three weeks. And I hadn't really been praying about it a whole, whole bunch, but, you know, I had really been thinking about it. And I'm saying now, Father, I, um, I, 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 I want us to prosper. But I got up one morning and I said to the Lord, and this is... I mean this, you know, like I I told you guys I'm selling these candles to support the work of the ministry. Now, I also need a job, so, you know, whatever. But um, I did get up one morning and I told the Lord that if he would, to let, let our work prosper, let the work of our hands be established for your glory, Lord. And there's a plan in my mind. There's something that I want to do. I believe that we can solve the problem of homelessness. I do believe that. And I do have an outline and a plan. And if the Lord will prosper me, I think that I shall, well, I, I think that through me, he might, with maybe in teamwork with someone else, provide shelter for some people. I can't do it all but I can do something. And if I can work through some people who are in a political discipleship uh, group, I, we might be able to submit some ideas to our council people and, and, and then establish this across the country. There is no reason, I don't think, in the United States where people should be homeless. 
not citizens of the country anyway. They should not be homeless and they should not have to pay enormous rents. Our rents are off the charts. Half the people working can't even afford to live because the rents are so high. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, see, that's what we pray for. See, I believe light touch gaps. If we if we desire to do the work of the kingdom, right? That God will prosper your hand. Like the Lord has never given me great wealth. I, I never had it. Even when my husband and I were making decent, you know, salaries, Tad was supporting everything. We didn't have great wealth. Why? Because Tad used to, he took care of his family. Um, and I would look up and mother would be calling to tell me that he was sending to them too. See, we didn't hoard the money. <laughs> we thank God for Tad's, um, my husband, he has vision. So he, he did have a really great portfolio, um, but it wasn't because he was hoarding. It's because he had a salary and, you know, they were building a 401k and he just was steady on with that. But he was a giver. He was a giver all the time. And so was I. I wasn't as wise as he was in my giving, but giving I did, you know, and giving. So I don't think about hoarding money. I don't think about big bank accounts. I don't think about, you know, buying a lot of um, stuff. Um, I, I rather think more about providing jobs. And if the Lord would prosper me, I think I would do that. I don't know. I pray that God would never let me run off the track, you know, if he gives me some money. I just don't want to run off the track. I don't want my eyes to um, to get big and, and desire the things of the world because they're so temporal and they're fleeting away. So this guy, Eric Little, to me, is an example. And I just wanted to bring it uh, 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 forward so that we could see that there are many people like Eric Little, was an ordinary man. He was just, he was born in China. He just went back to do the missionary work. Many people go to the mission field, and we never hear a thing about them. Let me tell you too. We go to church, and now now in my church, really and truly, my church supported the church that my children went grew up in while I was living in South Jersey. Uh, that church supported a couple of mission, two missionaries, and 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 they you know they let the congregation know about it. So. I met the missionary. We had dinner. She was in my home, you know, and then there was another one uh, from Africa and he he blessed my son and may God be praised that he did because my son's life was a little rocky there, you know, and uh, I believe that with all my heart that the influence and the impact of being with people who are working in the kingdom of God gave a foundation to my children. And no matter where they are in life, I believe that that foundation is holding them. I believe that. And so uh, we, you know, churches, I believe that that are working in, in the uh, U.S. and you know, missionaries have to, they have to fend for themselves. People go over there, nobody's paying and well, so, you know, some might be long to some organizations, but they pretty much go around and, and try to find churches and people who will send them a dollar or two so they can buy food they have accommodations and the one that that we were supporting was uh, she was in china and she was teaching and listen your life her life was on the line it was if she talked about jesus christ and she chose to go to china I'm not one to want to go. I don't want to go to China. I don't want to go. I don't want to go anywhere but around the corner from my house. That's where I want to go and see the need there and try to provide for it. So the 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 title here tonight is Discipleship in My Life. Where am I with regards to the call? The call of God to do the work of the kingdom. And it is not as illustrious or as, you know, um, glorified, glorified, I think as many times we want to make it or feel that we have a, a platform or a stage. So Eric Little, right, uh, she says that, um, hold on, I'm going to write you, I, I want you to, to hear this. So, so she says that, um, 
Eric Little spoke with her charming Scottish tongue, and more than anyone she had ever known, he typified the joyful Christian life. He had a marvelous sense of humor, was full of laughter and practical jokes, but always in good taste. His voice was nothing special, but how he loved to sing, particularly the grand old hymn of the faith. Two of his favorites were God Who Touches Earth with Beauty and There's a, a Wideness in God's Mercy. Great titles. I don't know either of these hymns. He was no great orator by any means, but he had a way of re- riveting his listeners with those marvelous clear blue eyes of his. Yes, that's what I remember most about him as he spoke, those wonderful eyes and how they would twinkle. And she was a child and uh, she's remembering Eric Little. And then the, the next part of this reading is full surrender. Though he had become an uncle and father figure to numerous children, Eric Little never saw his own wife and daughters in this world again. After writing a letter to Florence from his bed in the infirmary, he said to his friend and colleague, it's full surrender. He slipped into a coma and suffering with a brain tumor. He died in 1943, 1945. And while all Scotland mourned, all in heaven who had cheered Eric on as a servant of Jesus gave him a rich welcome. <laughs> so Margaret Holder is telling him the story and his, his there's, uh, you know, uh, comments from his sister and his daughter who says she never ever didn't feel very close to her father. So was it a tragic ending? If that's something that we would have to uh, contemplate that the Lord would use this man's life to hold all those people together, the old, the young, the middle-aged, during a time of internment and and great suffering in a China internment camp under such conditions, and then take him home. We have to wonder, Lord, what are you doing? Why do you do what you do? But he does it, and he does it for the glory of his own plan. God does a thing so that many, Jesus Christ died for the whole world. One man sacrificed for the entire world. And then he'll use one man also to save and to care for and to oversee a small cosmos as well. Is that you and is that me? Is the Lord able to use us for his own glorious plan for the outworking of others' salvation. Tears come to my eyes really to think about the amount of suffering in this world and how many churches there are, right? (laughs) And they never go outside to encounter the pain in the heart of others. There are many, you know, churches giving feed for food, food. So you feed a man or not, you give him a meal <laughs> once a week or whenever you do that. And um, they may have to eat the meal in a cardboard box that they call home. It's a sad life of the church. When Jesus Christ walked with his disciples, he called those disciples. And however, I I can imagine his voice was like, you know, gentle and kindness, but with, with an authority that would make one turn and pay attention. The Bible says that they went, that he called them and they turned and they went, and they went. And they were there. Those 12, and then there were 11, (laughs) and they were there, and he trained them, and they were with him. 
there is a movie uh, where it's 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 an eight part series really called The Chosen. You may have heard of it. Um, I I watched season one of it, and maybe I watched season two. And really, the story is so very well told of the life of Christ that you almost feel like what this guy has written is uh, exactly how it went. So I stopped watching it because I just started to say, people are going to watch this and really, it's it's so well done, they're going to really believe that this was how Jesus Christ was. And I don't know that we can know how Jesus, I don't know. But anyway, he did a good job. He did a really great job. Um, and, and as I watched it, this life of Eric Little reminds me of how the uh, script writer has written the life of Jesus Christ, suffering all the time and yet with joyfulness and strength and depth of character and love and outpouring over many people's lives and calling many to salvation and enduring the rejection from his own and the criticism from those leaders, spiritual leaders, who should have known. And if they didn't know, they should have taken time to seek the Lord. But the plan of God was in motion. And so that body called Jesus Christ, that prepared vessel through which the Lord ministered to his own first, because that's the promise. He promised that he would come to Israel. He promised he keeps his promise. But isn't it something? Watch his ways through the promise. He calls the entire world. He gives every man access to himself through his very promise to Abraham, to David, and then the prophetic word that he gives to his prophets. He's amazing. And I contemplate so often this Christian faith, right? And I know that other people have faith in the thing that they have faith in. And so you say, okay, well, what makes mine so different or so special? The witness of the salvation of God, the witness of the spirit, the witness is in us of the living God through Jesus Christ. And as we approach the relationship with commitment and surrender, that witness grows bigger and bigger because he thrills us with his presence. He actually visits with us. We actually hear his voice. We feel his embrace. We know he is near. And then the prophetic word just working itself out right before our very physical eyes. But because our spiritual life is alive, our spiritual our eyes now inform the physical eye, the natural eye with which our sight is so limited. And so we can hear and see, even our, we can see where God is, where we can see where he's going, what he is doing he's left us his word and it's all unfolding just as he said it would i suppose guys we love to laugh you know like we like to get together and just have a really good old time i certainly do i love to laugh but there are times as it is written in the book of um, ecclesiastes there's a time to weep and to mourn and sometimes when I contemplate what God has done and how little we do to make sure that other people know what he has done, those people who don't know him, right? I want to mourn. Yes. Uh, Light Church says, Psalm 56, 8, my God, make me a willing vessel of honor to the lifelong lifting of your glory. And raise your name above all other names in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Yeah. I shall read uh, comments now. 
Thank you for coming. Tony, thank you for being here. Teeny, thank you for being here. Sister Reeves, for Gabs. It's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> amen, amen. Tony, we just share. Oh, thank you for sharing the show, of Tony. And um, I can hear you from the beginning. Yes, thank you so much. A good evening. Okay, so those are just greetings. Everybody's coming in. And uh, I'm trying to get to the comments. I hope you will. Glory to God. I would, oh, Light Touch says, um, glory to God. I would like to think I would be that one who opened my home to others in need and give what I have to the hungry. As a child, I witnessed my dad do these things. Surely we did. Yes. And my mother, <clears throat> you know, feeding other children in the neighborhood um, when they would come to play with us. If mother called us to food, she would call the children in too. And many times the children would come. And so, yeah, you've been, we've been mentored. I want you to know that um, uh, <laughs> you've done more than you probably know. Because um, Gabs was a support to my children. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. It, the tears of the righteous are bottled up in heaven. Hallelujah. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. It is written in the book of the Revelation. That's right. You cannot cry a tear that God does not feel in his own heart for us. <clears throat> and, you know, I said I was going to find that scripture for us, and I just never do. I don't know why, but it keeps coming to my mind. <clears throat> After you've suffered a while, I'm going to try to look for it now. Now, if you can find it with me, help me. Um, that you, we will be established. After we have suffered a while. And so God's ways in, in preparing us. It, it isn't just to serve the people. You know, God is, is um, preparing us for eternal life. For a relationship with him that will never end. For being that chosen generation. And it begins at our salvation and it doesn't stop. We will be then the church without spot or wrinkle. And that's who will see him forever. We'll be him, uh, with him forever. Let's see, after you've suffered a while. Come on, help me find that, guys. I keep never doing that. Just choosing rather you do well than suffer than suffer for righteousness. Oh, gosh, I don't see it. I'm going to find it. You'll be established. It's one. It's a scripture that really, really I kind of walk with, and it's always in my head, but I can't find it. Light touch, you usually can find them for me, so <laughs> you'll see that one. After you suffer for a while, ah, uh, I don't know, but yes, yes, yes. The the life of Eric Little is just an example. You know, he's not the only one. Um, we have the Bible because people wouldn't give up they just oh thank you first peter 10 what first peter 1 10 okay thank you gabs that's good let me let me get to it and read it mm -hmm. i want to read that one is it one first peter 10 it's first peter 5 Okay, well, chapter 5, is it chapter 5, verse 10, 4 or 5? I'm going to go there. Hmm. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. I love that. Oh, and then this, we should read the whole thing. That's right. That is right. After you've suffered a while, the God of all glory, he will do it. And that's what he does. And But the whole chapter is for, is worth our reading. And I will read. Thank you so much. Guys, I've been just searching that script. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to say, where, where is it? Where is it? There was a time when I could uh, just really, really pull it out. I don't do that so good anymore. But we're going to read that whole chapter and contemplate it. 
Thank God for parents. Oh, that's been my experience as well. What an example for a child's experience to witness. That's right. Uh, to see your parents live a life of, um, they just live the life. You know, it's, it's, it was their life. It was our lives. That's, that's what it was. And that's how it is. And um, I used to tell daddy, daddy would let people, it was just so funny. I went home one one time and and the, someone had connected their hose to our kitchen sink. It was a long way from the, from the street to the kitchen sink. I guess he went through the window. I don't know how that happened. And the man was cleaning, uh, fixing his house, refurbishing his house, using my using the water in our house in, in, in North Carolina. You have to pay for the water use. I guess we do it here too, but I don't pay the bills anyway. Um, and I said, Dad, do you know this man is coming over there with furniture's house every day? He's drawing drawing the water from the kitchen. I'm saying, Oh, Daddy, you know you got to pay for this. And he said, mm -hmm. or something like that. I don't know what Daddy said, but that man refurbished his house using Dad's water. My father was quite a giver. He surely was, and the stories that we heard uh, of his life. Uh, attest to that. He was a giver and he uh, respected and took care of the elderly. And um, that's just a, so thanks for sharing Eric Little's story, Sister P. Seems to have been completely sold out for Christ. Yeah. And there are a number of these stories, you know, that now that I'm talking about discipleship and, and uh, a life, living a life for Christ, these guys are coming back to me. And uh, Eric Little just showed up in my mind. The, the Monday we could have get together. And um, if you didn't see the movie, I'm sure that you can find it on on uh, something, one of these, you know, cyberspace <laughs> movie givers. So it's a, it's a really good story, a good movie, but it's a better story to read. When you read the story of these uh, lives, uh, it, they're better told because they're more detailed. Another great one is um, the guy who did the, my favorite, my utmost for his highest, uh, the, um, he died to at age 48. I think he was 48. There are so many stories and we don't even have to go back that far. Really and truly there are people today who live their lives in, in, in service. They are completely, um, uh, what is the word? I won't say sold out. They're they're very aware. They are they're Christians. They are those who live with Christ living through them. Uh, an excellent example of all the God to love one another, to be kind, to care. Absolutely. Let's stop. That's right. Just just take the moment. Just do what we have to do as Christians, and always let the Holy Spirit, the heart of God speak through us. Let the leading and the guiding of the Spirit of God always take us where we, uh, where God wants us to go. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you know, there are times, Father, when the, just the contemplation of our lives in you, you living in us is very profound. It's a lot to take in. We are weak, Lord God, and we don't always do things, I'm sure, by the Spirit of God, but we ask your forgiveness. And we ask you, Lord God, to continue to raise us up to be your children. Because when the trumpet sounds, we every one of us want to hear it. We every one of us want to be caught up. To ever be with you in the air. Caught up, Lord God, to live in eternity. That's our desire. Now, we cannot make ourselves want to do such a thing as give up all the earthly pleasures that you have blessed us with. It isn't within us to want to do that necessarily. But Father, your love and your light and your life in us changes us to be in compliance and alignment with what you desire from each one of us. Keep on changing us. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And bless every one of you out there. I pray on behalf of all of us. I pray that God will hear our cries and know our hearts and help us. And I pray that the Lord will prosper us so that when we are called upon to do something that is beyond our, you know, the family or just that little thing, that we'll have sufficient. 
to be able to share and to give, to make another person's life, to show them the value of their life and to make that life one that can also see the goodness of God. We pray, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And with that, my darlings, it is time to go. Right? The Lord has been so, so faithful and he has been so, so good. And now uh, we've had, again, another feast. It was a more solemn feast than usual. But it was a feast nonetheless, right? Anytime we're learning about the Lord, Anytime we're looking at a witness for the Father, anytime we see others who have given themselves to absolute surrender, we can be very, very pleased and know that it is possible to live an exceptional life in Christ Jesus. With that, I bid you all a very pleasant good evening.